Are you all good? Where, right. where are you, Ralph? I'm in my uh, makeshift office slash pole barn right now. I've been using it uh, partial time during this post-COVID era, or during COVID, I don't know, wherever we are. I can't work out if the, I thought it was the, was it a design studio or something, because you've got like this white ceiling on top of you, but it looks, yeah, are you right, right up against it? Yeah, I could touch it. It's only maybe half, a third of a meter from my head. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Everyone talks about it. They think it's a backdrop, but it's just my ceiling. <laughs> Ralph, I, I look, I, I, I'm conscious of your time, so I'm gonna just jump straight into it. Um, I prepared some questions for us to start off with, and I think what I'll probably do instead of this going in a um chronological order, I'll start with the 2008 crisis. Um, oh jeez, sure. Yeah. Um, I am first off, I just need to tell you that I'm a massive massive fan of the abstract series and i did most of my resource oh. research based on that episode so um yeah if it's uh if it's maybe not accurate then yeah it's you've got them to blame not me <laughs> um there are you are in 2008 there was obviously you you talked about this perfect storm with um uh this this private equity company coming up coming and scooping uh yeah scooping up um chrysler and then also we had the 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 recession and you said that you only yeah. lost three percent of your staff during that period and the rest of the company lost like 40 to 50 um can you talk a little bit about why you were able to retain so much of your team well it's interesting because during that time uh, a lot of my designers came to my, literally to my office, almost like a receiving line. They queued up and asked me, so what should we do? Because the offers were quite good. I mean, they were offering a, a free car, uh, $75,000 for you to, if you had more than five years. So it was a very, one of the most generous um, buyouts I've ever seen. But I kept telling them, hey, you know, there's nothing like a comeback story. You know, everything starts with, with a product, with products. And we knew that we were, at the time, actually, our stuff wasn't that good. You know, we had fairly uh, plasticky interiors. We had tech that was kind of out of date. So, and then I, I always reminded them that we are sitting on some amazing brands. You know, Jeep is one of the, the most renowned brands in the world. All we have to do is fix the product. And in the meantime, honestly, we were in the middle of, of designing the new Grand Cherokee, which was about a third of the way through. We were in the clay stages. And I had so, I was so happy about that product. I knew if, if ever the world would see it, it would, it would do well. Um, so there was basically that speech. I repeated this idea of we are what's going to fix this, not not running away from this, embracing the challenge and pulling together. And it was an amazing sense of solidarity and a team almost like, hey, it's not that much better out there anyway. It was the whole, <laughs> the whole the United States and the whole world was going through a crisis. So we kind of huddled together and said, let's, you know, and I actually lied to them. I, cre I created a bunch of artificial projects to keep them distracted, uh, concept stuff, uh, next gen Viper. We were working on all kinds of made up projects to keep them distracted where what exact what position were you uh holding at that time i had literally only months prior just inherited uh head of design of the whole group so my previous boss literally hightailed it out of there he was uh, and he was near retirement anyway he was 64 i believe he was right at that age and he said ralph good luck <laughs> i'm out <laughs> you know uh, and he handed me the keys you know and i was like whoa and i honestly I, it felt to me at the time about 10 years premature. I, I just felt I was only basically 39 years old, uh, 38 years old. That's insane. And he, I know. And he handed me, and before that, you have to understand that um, Chrysler over the years had been poached heavily by other companies. So a lot of the top execs had been poached away or they left because it was always going through some tur turbulence, right? So, and I was, I don't know, I love it. I love the challenge. I love the underdog thing. So I, I after throwing up <laughs> in the toilet, I <laughs> gathered myself and uh, started to, to lead, you know. Did you 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 obviously said that um you know you felt completely out of out of your depths and and I wonder like at that age who did you turn to for guidance in that period uh, for a while I didn't really have uh, too many uh, some aunts and uncles that I, I really confided in and my wife honestly she she would was my strength and we had kids at the time that were very young they were you know a great distraction right they were oblivious to what's going on. So I would just come home and be with them and just be in the moment. And honestly, we didn't really let, you know, we didn't turn the news on or anything. We just kind of focused on isolating ourselves a little bit because if you really overthought it, 
you'd lose your mind, to be honest with you. So we just focused on that. And at work, I focused on work. And we actually had the same reaction. We had a handful of engineers that were so dedicated to the new Grand Cherokee and the new Durango. And, and, and we were working on the next gen um, Charger and Challenger at the time. So we had a lot of fun. My studio happened to be at the time the truck studio and the rear drive studio. So I was working on some fun stuff already. So the, the whole thing just kind of gelled. Yeah. But how many, um, how many people were you kind of looking after at that time, Ralph? 380 or so. We had almost 400 people. We had lost, like I said, 4%, so only only a handful at the time. And they were people that probably were close to retirement anyway. We didn't really lose the core. Um, if anything, it created some promotions. Ironically, during that time, we were able to promote a lot of people into leadership. And that was a kind of an unintended consequence, you know. And you, um, with, you know, you've obviously spoken to your guys and you said, listen, just hang on a little bit. We're going to keep, we, uh, there's, there's other things coming up. Everything's going to be okay. Um, can you shed some light on, on maybe some of the other battles that you had to fight behind the scenes with other, other people in the company? So that's a very good question because on one side I had this, this bubble effect. I created a bubble around my office and my family. On the other side, I was still in all the executive meetings because being promoted to that level, I had a seat at the table and I was hearing all of these traumatic things. And they were asking us to cut, 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 cut cost, uh, cut stuff out of the programs, um, sell if it wasn't bolted down. And I, I happen to be a, in, in charge of the historical collection. We have hundreds of beautiful one of one vehicles and they asked us to sell them. And, and part of the project was to assess their value. So we went and, and assessed them. and. And honestly, we lied. <laughs> we told them they were worthless. Um, and they kind of looked at other things at the time. So it was kind of this constant, because if you think about it, a private equity company, if they can't fix it quickly, they tend to dismantle yeah, it and sell yeah. it. And that's what they were trying to do. They were, they were looking at every opportunity to keep the lights on and, and wait for someone to come scoop us up or something like that. And what was the, what was the turning point at that? When, when did you feel like, a sense of, uh, I guess you never out of the clear, but I mean, when did you feel a sense of relief? The day I met, um, uh, two things happened. So I remember watching, uh, so we went home for Christmas holiday, like everybody else does. I went to my mom's and at the time we had leadership meetings constantly. Every couple of uh, days they would call us together because there was a lot going on in the government. So it was also an election year. Uh, Obama was, was uh, taking over from uh, Mr. Bush at the time, uh, President Bush. And Obama was pro saving the industry, right? So there was all this discussion about do we do we hand out a loan or some kind of loan? I hate the word handout because it wasn't a handout. It was a very high interest loan <laughs> because no bank in the world was lending money to anyone. So uh, the only way to save this thing was to, to get some money, uh, guaranteed money. And at the same time, um, I had a visit just at that time prior to going on vacation or holiday, a visit from uh, Marchioni. So Sergio Marchioni from the Fiat Group did a quick visit. I mean, a bunch of his henchmen came in a black car. They came out, you know, four or five of them. I didn't, at the time, I didn't know who they were. He was smoking a cigarette. And I remember telling him, you can't smoke in my dome. And he goes, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at, he looked at me in, in a way like, uh, I hate to use this expression, but a bit like a mafia boss, like he was going to put this cigarette out in my forehead. And at that point, as intimidating as he was, there was a rush of excitement because I had a feeling this guy is knows what he's doing. And he walked through very quickly, asked me a lot of questions about the product. What was future? What was concept? Cause I had put together a bunch of concepts. I threw everything together cause they gave me only a one day notice. So I put this show together that, that, you know, honestly put each brand in a pretty good light. I showed the best of our last products and also some stuff we were working on. And he, I think he left rather impressed because things started to percolate after that. Did you um at that point did you did you have to spend spend much time in Europe at all or were you were you just primarily in Detroit? At that time, I was still in Detroit. Things um didn't start picking up until about May of uh, two thousand nine when when uh, they started to kind of I mean, things were really messy. But the group he was kind of interviewing the next generation of leaders, and at that time they already had um uh, a leader uh, Ramachotti who was head of design for the Fiat Group was doing great stuff over there. Um, so he put me in charge of basically fixing everything. So the first assignment, he said, we're going to do 14 products. Actually, I think it was, yeah, 14 all new, uh, 18 products ultimately we did, but the, the challenge was about 14. He gave us money because we'd got this tranche of money. He said, okay, we're going to invest in every single car, Ralph. You give us some ideas. And he worked with the product planning team and the brands. So it was actually a rush of excitement. So we were busy just staying put in the U.S. Yeah. Insane. 
Um, Ralph, I can you? Sorry to to cheapen the conversation, but um, I <laughs> was well, not cheapening a conversation. I just I'm a big big fan of the of the series, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that if I could. I mean, what? Um, yeah, sure. how how long did it take to to film that whole series? It took uh, I think about total eight months, I believe, because um, Chai uh, is amazing. Chai Varsalikski. Vers- sorry, I can't say your last name. But Chai is amazing. Um, so Scott Dadich is the is the the, the yeah. producer, the idea man, and Chai was the the director. Uh, and it started with interviews, very just basic interviews. They asked me to sit down in the dome in a chair and another chair, and it was just a bunch of like a literally a four hour long interview. And they went away. They went away for about a, three four weeks. Um, then they called with more questions, and then they came back for another interview. So I was like, this is strange. No cameras yet. It was all just it was one little camera just to cover the interview. And then um, they came back with okay. You said this, you said this, we want to go in your studio, we want to see this project. So everything I'd said they had noted and created a construct of uh, the development of the concept portal. Um, and uh, we had we had to really talk to legal because they wanted to go deep into our inner sanctum. And we've never had cameras uh, so far deep into our studios for that length of time. Because they were there, when they came, they were there for almost two days. They set up camp and it was quite disruptive, but exciting at the same time. How did you get the clearance from the rest of the company? I uh, didn't ask. I just <laughs> our, head, our, our head of PR barely understood what we were trying to do. Marconi was actually oblivious of the whole thing because he was, I don't know, for some reason, I tried to describe it, but it was so abstract. You know, the, the whole concept didn't, it was Netflix and they didn't, the, the older generation honestly had no idea what Netflix was. So I just, I said, I, I'm going to give it a chance. So we just took a chance and, and we made them say what they could film and what they couldn't film. And I, you know, I remember telling Chai, uh, this has to be about the team. Stop making it about me, because she kept going back to my life, and I was trying to redirect her interest on the team. Is she is she di- directing every single episode, or is it just she, what she did two two of the um, I forget the other one. I think she did the uh, the artist in New York, but yeah, she's she's outstanding. She's she's done Meru. She did um, Free Solo. Uh, she just did The Rescue um, and many other things. She's an amazing, amazing director. And did you get to meet any of the other people? Was uh, it like a a pre a pre launch like party for all the the stars? We tried to yeah, we tried to meet. Uh, briefly met Tinker from Nike, and uh, we tried to create a few events where we would actually speak together. So we we met a handful of each other. But honestly, I would love to meet the rest. I was fascinated. I've seen both series, and uh, just amazing. They've done a really got Scott Dadish's group did a great job finding all these obscure jobs that people don't think about absolutely incredible and i think it just does so much for i mean not just not just car design but all those different industries you know because for me i mean one like one of my favorite episodes was the christoph Niemann episode and and it's like if you told me you know there's a watercolor illustrator from berlin on paper it doesn't sound that fascinating you know but it was so (laughs) well captured and i think they just did such a great job in 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 sparking interest you know and yeah and we we all we all had a lot of parallels. All of us were, were passionate about it as kids, you know, and, and chased our dreams. And that's ultimately what I hoped came of this, that some youngster somewhere would see a spark and say, wow, I love to do this thing, you know. And, and people may laugh at you when you're sketching in your little book all the time, but look what can happen. Ralph, on, on that subject of, of, of being a little kid, I mean, you weren't quite a little kid at the stage, but you t- spoke quite candidly about how, you know, a conservative your father was and um, how, how much pressure he put on you to become either the doctor, lawyer, engineer, or whatever the case is. You studied engineering, five weeks into yep. it, you decide this is not for me. <laughs> how do you have, exactly. how do you have that, 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 that um, how do you know that this is not working? Uh, I just lost interest. I remember being in class and I would, first of all, sit in the back of the class, which is a bad sign, right? <laughs> so, and I was drawing and missing some of the conversation. I just wasn't interested. I just didn't feel uh, it was exciting. And I was actually really good at trigonometry and calculus in, in high school. But when I went to the college level, it was intense, but it was just, it didn't excite me. I just lost interest in it. Um, and I quickly fell behind. At that point, I was trying to get tutoring and I just couldn't keep up. And I actually just mentally quit. And I remember having the conversation with my parents and they just gave me the cold shoulder. It was like, wow, they were just so, because that doesn't happen in our family. We don't, I was straight A's, honor roll student, all that stuff. So they just didn't know what to deal with it. I like to say I, I invented the gap year before it was fashionable. And were you, were you like, as your brother described, you were literally just sitting in the basement 
drawing and he sort of he, he came home and he felt this like atmosphere in the in the home was it really as it was described yeah it was kind of a dreamer right so my, my parents did acquiesce and buy me a, a big drafts table so i put it in the basement the only place it would fit and i kind of turned it into a makeshift um uh, studio and i would draw all kinds of stuff but mostly cars and, and scenes and things like that um not a fine artist by any means but i just love to to imagine spaceships and sci-fi stuff um, and yeah, and he came down and he always loved that about me. He always found that fascinating because he didn't have any drawing skills. Um, so he loved to, to watch what I would do next. And he was very supportive because like, you know, he chased his dream was to be a doctor and he, he achieved it. Um, but being three years older than me, older than me, he had a bit of wisdom I didn't have. Yeah. I, I'm, I wonder like if you had a, a game plan at all, or were you just kind of trying to get through that, <laughs> that difficult time? That's that's a very good question. I think I was using the art as as therapy at the time, not really thinking of, of it as a career because I was working. I found a job at a local hardware store. I was unloading trucks and, and doing um, – it's funny. My artistic skills came out in the uh, the displays. I ended up setting up the displays at the store. So they say, hey, you're really good at that. And I guess it has something to do with the ability to lay things out. <laughs> um, but again, my brother, he's like, R Ralph, you got to convert this into something. You're too good at this not to, to have it be – be a job um, or something in a career and then uh, you, you, i'm sure you i think i talked about the letter from my aunt forced me to write to uh, to chrysler at the time and the and so you you wrote the letter to lee iacocca and then uh neil neil whaling re responded to you yeah and is it wow, you really uh, remember <laughs> <laughs> i do i've you know i've studied i've just i'm obsessed with that film it's when it when, sorry that whole series when it came out like five years ago ish i've watched the whole thing yeah. countless times and uh first series is definitely better than the second one in my opinion mm -hmm. but um anyway uh what did you oh, you threw me off now no uh, neil <laughs> neil whaling did he he hired you as well is that right yeah, he was uh, basically uh, number two in the office at the time. Uh, he was he was like the executive design head for advanced concepts. So uh, I'm sure what happened is Neil Walling, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Icoca got the letter, passed it on to Neil. Neil looked it over and said, oh, okay, this kid's got, and then, then he wrote back. And and some, I know I do that today. I, I write back to, to a lot of people that, that send me similar letters. Uh, what I didn't know though, is that it, there were schools. There were actually colleges that teach car design. I, I thought it was an engineering type of degree. Uh, but the problem is, at the time, they were in the U.S. You know, he he had listed off four schools in the U.S. Ah, uh, and you in uh, you were in Quebec at this time, yeah. Right, exactly, and it seemed like on the other side of the planet to me. I, you know, I'd only been to the U.S. for quick holidays in my aunt's house and in, in, uh, in Syracuse, New York, spending time in her basement sketching, <laughs> and she, that's how she knew because I was I was working again at a. Uh, my parents didn't know what to do with me in the summer, so they shipped me off to New York. And I was sketching, and that's when she said, "Wow, you, you're really good at that." We actually wrote the letter before I even went to engineering school. Um, so this letter, I was barely 16 years old when when we wrote the letter to Coca. So it had been sitting in our family. The the, the letter came back only months later, and we kind of set it aside. So I knew of it in the back of my mind that it was possible, but it didn't seem tangible. So it wasn't it wasn't a, a game plan. I mean, it just you kind of forgot about it almost. Exactly. And my brother's the one who shook me. He, he's like, Ralph, yeah, where's that letter? Because we all talked about it. We were, the whole family was just fascinated that this huge corporation wrote back to us. You know, So we joked about the letter, but didn't take it seriously. But he actually said, Ralph, you got to turn this into something. And, and so we did. We applied to one of the schools um, in Detroit, which was physically, it seemed the closest one, but also one of the best ones. We had re read up on it. No internet back then. So it was all you know, calling up the school and, and trying to. We ended up speed. My brother was in school in Cleveland. He drove up to Detroit and just invited himself into the dorms. He literally walked into the dorm. Security was non-existent back then and knocked on some doors and he, he met a few seniors and he took pictures of their work and he sent, he literally had them developed and sent them to me and said, this is cool. The whole place is full of model cars. It smells like clay. It's got... <laughs> so he was so into it. He was like, you got to come here. This is place is made for you. Yeah. And when you went for your interview at, um, at Chrysler, did he remember... Did he, he obviously didn't remember that letter, did he? Cause he... No, he didn't, but I told him about it. <laughs> and did... and uh, one, one day I – sorry. No, 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 carry on. No, one day I did uh, show it to him because I, I actually you know lost the letter. My, my father had tucked it away, and we lost track of it. And it wasn't sadly until my father passed away in 98 
uh, we were cleaning his effects and we stumbled on the letter again. So then I was like, I'm not losing this again. So wow. we, I framed it. You know? <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Did you have, yeah. because of that letter, did you have like an emotional connection to the company? Absolutely. Um, and, and honestly, when I graduated from school, I got some offers, uh, Ford and, and Honda in Ohio gave me an offer for it. And then Jim was interested in discussing further with myself and then Chrysler. And then it was no decision. It was no discussion. I mean, Chrysler because of the letter, but also I, I actually love the, they were just starting to show the Viper concept. They had the Portofino concept. So there's some exciting stuff starting to happen. over there. Who, who was it that did the Portofino? Cause I, that was also a car that I only just found about through that series. I believe it was Kevin Verdun. Um, who did it, who sadly, he, he just passed away this last year. Um, amazing designer. He was ahead of our advanced uh, studios in California, him and Dan Sims and a few others. Yeah. Did you, have you for the most part got to meet like all the people that you've wanted to meet? Absolutely. And, and then more so. <laughs> the other thing about our career is, is it, it's a bit of a small society, you know, so we bump into each other at auto shows. So I've met, you know, designers, I've even the greats like Jujaro finally got to meet him. And, and all the other amazing that are still alive. Even Ramachodi, who was he called out of retirement to design Fiat's and Alfa Romeo's. I got to meet him, and, and uh, I'm actually driving some of the cars the greats, you know, designed back in those days. So it's it's amazing, this career. It's, it is a, a club in a way, uh, a club of, of designers from all eras still respect each other. Absolutely. I also found out that you, you got to meet the great uh, Muhammad Ali as well on your travels. Oh. Yes, yes. That was oh my gosh. <laughs> I have a great picture of that moment. Um and we were I was at an award show and he is his manager found out and called me and it was he was very generous. He wanted to he saw this this other young young uh person of color and he wanted to, to meet me. And at the time he was actually pretty there was periods when you could have a conversation with him, but he was obviously he had some issues. But amazing, amazing gentleman. Ralph, well, I I want to um can we talk about that a little bit cuz you on on the subject of race cuz I I'm not the most PC person and I don't know always how to handle the situation but um I know that um you were like the youngest I mean probably one of the first apart from Ed Welber and the highest achieving African American well not American but um person of color to achieve what you've achieved in the automotive industry and uh, I wonder if you um have you consulted with Ed over the years about um, how to navigate this predominantly white industry? Unfortunately, we actually have only become friends in the last five years. Since he's retired, um, we we go, we bump into each other all the time. We're actually good friends. We go to dinner. Our, our our partners, you know, my wife and his partner, have known each our friends themselves. So we've actually become really good friends. I wish I would have reached out to him when I was when he was still working. But even in in this time, he's offered some incredible wisdoms. And, but just watching him from afar, watching him operate, I was always impressed by Ed's class, you know, very, very uh, put together person, a uh, very patient. Um, he has, you know, everybody has their, their idiosyncrasies, but in general, he, he, uh, he, he put some, he did some amazing things with his position. And, and honestly, that paves the way for others. Uh, you are also involved in a couple of uh, charities as well that, um, that mm -hmm. as I understand it they're kind of internal charities that look after things like women empowerment but also um, racial inequality um, or mm -hmm. maybe that's not the correct term but I, I, like could you talk a little bit about what sort of things you guys do to give young kids um, of color the, a shot at the title sort of thing well, number one is to, to educate them. One of the, the most important things we, we did pre-COVID was to go out to local high schools. And in, I've been to, to inner city schools in Chicago, Atlanta, um, a little bit in Cleveland, and especially in Detroit, several schools, and speaking to them, having my designers. Um, we've actually collected a handful of designers of color and, and white designers uh, from them. We have a lot of Eastern Bloc uh, designers as well. And, and you know we have a very colorful office. It's actually amazing. This industry draws a lot of people from different parts of the world, but just having them tell their story to middle school or, or in some cases, um, early high school kids is life changing for them. Um, because a lot of my designers have similar stories. Um, we have one that, that a single mom situation uh, grew up uh, literally in trouble and, and found art and, and is now a very successful interior designer for us. So having them uh, go to speak to the students has been the most effective things we can do. 
as a corporation, of course, we work the United Way that, that tries to get kids, you know, computers and laptops and things like that. And my wife's charity is actually outstanding. She she um, supports, that's our way of giving back personally. Uh, she supports, um, you know, anything from battered women to to the homeless and to people, women in shelters. She tries to be a booster and help, you know, a lot of these charities have terrible marketing. Uh, and so we try to shed light on them. And, and we have a lot of great contacts, people that have a lot of wealth. So trying to connect them and they're looking, always looking for places to help um, directly. So we, we, we kind of put them together. We create events that bring awareness to these other charities. So she's like a booster, super booster to several, several charities. And she's raised over uh, nearly half a million oh, dollars. Oh, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Ralph, do you think we ever see un, like the demand in general is is a lot lower for designers than what it would have been like you know thirty, twenty, even thirty years ago? Um, do you think we'll ever see a time again where companies would sponsor um, students outright to you know so that they don't have to get into bucket loads of debt to to study design? Well, I, I think the demand has never been higher, to be honest. We're, we're, the, the difference is the complexion of designers is changing. So we still need classic car designers. We need, um, but I'm finding I need to hire um, UX designers, for example, people that design infotainment systems come from different schools than the one I went to. Um, totally different types of education, HMI specialists. Uh, we're gamers, we're hiring gamers. Um, we're literally taking them out of their parents' basement and trying to get them to come work for us. Um, they're outstanding at coding and, and writing apps. Uh, so the auto industry is, is is smelling and looking more like a tech industry. Uh, but the you know the block and tackle design is actually hotter than ever because we're, other industries are starting to discover the attributes of design. So if you think about cars becoming electric, when, when I grew up, it was all about the horsepower. It was all about what engine was in the car. In the future, it's going to be what tech is in the car and, and how compelling is the interior design and the exterior design. So I don't think design is going anywhere. Um, and I actually love to see the industries every widget out there is has a designer behind it so if it's not the auto industry there's a lot of other industries that are are really scooping up designers how how would you how do you see um improve what improvements do you do you, could you see in design education for example uh number one is is reaching out earlier um because in i don't know about europe and other places but in the u.s um art is almost vanquished from schools uh when I grew up, every school I knew had an art program of some kind, even in elementary and then high school uh, or, or finishing school. Um, but they're almost gone. Right now, there's only a handful of dedicated art schools left that we work with some in, in uh, Cleveland. There's one we're trying to get set up in Detroit, and there's one in Florida, and maybe a handful he here and there. But you, that's the biggest tragedy, I think. Art is underrepresented in, in education in, in general. Because they don't, they, everyone is so focused on STEM, which is great. But I'm always a believer that you should add A and call it STEAM. <laughs> but sorry, because what is what is STEM? Yeah. STEM. STEM is uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. Uh, okay. I think that's what the T stands for. But you you hear the government's always talking about STEM, and so science is big, and they're pushing that. That's great. We need that. But art has actually been pushed aside and defunded from most schools. I think one of the things that has become more apparent is that, I mean, especially in um, in recent times, is that having a creative pursuit as a career is a viable option. And I think, like, I mean, it was different. It was obviously a lot different to when, when you were growing up. But even when I was growing up in South Africa, I mean, I had, you know, I, we were still encouraged to take things like accounting and business economics because you were discouraged from becoming – um, a struggling artist for the rest of your life, you know, but exactly. the whole thing of car design to me, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about that, you know? Um, so, you know, your point, your point about reaching out earlier, I think is, is very, very important. And I think architecture could say the same. I think you name it. Um, and the other thing that's happened in my time is, is the tools have become incredible. The 3d drawing tools, you can download free, um, uh, 3D apps where you can design something and have a 3D printer in your in your bedroom printed out in in less than a couple of days and that's amazing and and the software is very intuitive and almost anyone who has a little bit of creativity can create bespoke parts for a vintage car or something a sculpture or a set of a chess pieces whatever you want you know but do you do you um do you ever see there being a time at least in in your part of the world where you guys will maybe not require a formal design education? No, I, I think it's very important. Um, there are some 
fundamentals that you have to learn. Um, and a lot of people, like one of my best classes I took as a designer was actually figure drawing. Uh, learning how to, to emulate nature initially teaches you so much and observing nature and, and the fundamentals of design. Now, we've never hired a designer that doesn't have a degree. Um, other companies out on the West Coast have started to do that because there is some talent out there that, that doesn't necessarily need a formal. If you're good, you're good. If you know what you're doing, you, it's intuitive. Um, so if that's what you mean, maybe. And I think we need to open our minds to that because not everyone is cut out to go to college. But yeah, I mean that that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean there are instances where you've got this person that's got the skill that is undeniable that you can see. Okay, well, you know, getting into a hundred or two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, um, is it doesn't really yeah. make any sense. But I know that for the for the I mean many companies, it's it, it is a prerequisite regardless of what position you hold to have a formal degree or college education. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that because we, we actually it's something we're looking at. So some of our clay modelers, most of them do not have college educations and a handful of them are so good. They've expressed interest uh, in, this, in the design side. So we've actually allowed them to sketch and play and, 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 and it's working. So it's something uh, it's, I got to I need you to talk to my HR people. <laughs> but how can you can you talk a little bit about that transition Ralph because I like my experience is that generally speaking I mean it's it's different wherever you go but I've worked in a few different studios and some of them are very much like no 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 clay guys need to stay in their lane alias guys need to stay in their lane and um you know they um <clears throat> it's gr it's cute that you want to sketch but you know you you that's not going to happen um have you have you guys actually got proper programs in place, or is that just an initiative that you've? I have to be honest with you. So the, our clay modelers are actually union, and we're unique that way. That's uh, that's probably a leftover from the past, um, and we're trying to change it actually. And I can't legally say that, but no, no, no. We're that's... Yeah, we're hoping the union um, and in the General Motors, for example, they're not union, so that they'd have re retrained clay modelers to be alias guys. And also designers. So there has been, because there's a lot of common, if you understand surface dimensions, proportions, there's a lot of crosstalk in those disciplines. So I think that's where we have to go. Um, and in school, we've actually had that happen uh, where we have some clay modelers that are so good, they, they miss their calling, you know. So we, we they actually, we give them a lot of liberty when they do the clay. Um, and that's exactly what happens in our truck studio. We have this young kid, uh, Charlie, who's, you could do a Netflix episode just on him. I mean, he, on the weekends, he's a drifter. He drifts his Mustang, and then during the day, he's uh, one of the best sketch modelers I've ever seen. I mean, he can do a whole body side of a car in a few days that he doesn't need to sketch because he can do it 3D with his hands, you know. So that that skill to me is, is fascinating. Would you see somebody like a Charlie just skipping the sketching stage and just going like, this is my proposal already in 3D? Why not? Why not? Um, we'll, we'll take the ideas from any, any way that we can get them. It's rare. He's definitely a unicorn, but... When they're out there, you, you got to harness it. You know? Yeah, that's it's it's really interesting. I mean, there are some guys like that that are just talent is undeniable, and I think. Um, but it's great that you guys recognize that as well, because often it, this is kind of overlooked, you know, because you guys have got so much going on. I mean, especially in in somebody like your position. Um, Ralph, I also discovered that you have done an MBA. Yeah. When did you do that? So I, you remember, I told you my father passed away in 98 and we were very, you know, close near the end. Um, and he always talked about higher education. He said, Ralph, he never believed in my in my design degree. He thought it was a little bit soft, you know. So he goes, you got to bolster that with a, a business degree. And in all honesty, I've always had an interest in, in the whole machine of business, the entire, you know, soup to nuts, uh, bolt, you know. So I did. I, I went back to school and, and our company has a wonderful program for executives. They have a... a accelerated MBA program that you can do at night. So that's what I did. I got sponsored by my, uh, at the time he was very high up in the company. Tom Gale sponsored me. Um, look him up. He's one of the greatest designers. He did a lot of those cars like the Portofino was, were done under him. And I asked him because he had an engineering degree. He had a business degree and a design oh degree. Oh my God. Said, How did you do that? You know, and, he, and I wanted to say, when I grow up, I want to be like you, you know? And he goes, really Ralph, that was hard, you know? And, and he wasn't kidding. Cause I was just having babies. I just had two kids. My wife, uh, luckily, she was working at the time still, and I was going to night school and, you know, um, being a designer and teaching at CCS. I was teaching at my, my alumni at my old school. So it was a perfect storm, but I, I learned so much uh, in, in business school that I still use to this day. 
Uh, so sitting on, on these councils I have for the last 10 years, I'm able to decode all that information I'm exposed to. Is that, was that, do you think you would have achieved what you achieved without that, without that cause? Yeah, I don't think it's necessary. That's more of a personal thing. But to be honest, I, I was head of Dodge for five years. I don't know if they would have given me that opportunity had I not had the business degree. Uh, so it, you know, I've been able to dabble, you know, and I was doing that on top of my design job. So that's the thing about my my previous boss, Sergio Marchioni. Uh He was he was willing to challenge us. So at one time, I had four jobs on top of each other, um, and it, it was exciting. I've learned so much in that time. When you 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 were the CEO of Dodge, was that yeah. So and and were you not doing any design work or were you doing both? No, I I was still doing full time design and I was basically I would work from seven to two o'clock as head of design, from two o'clock to six or seven o'clock at night as CEO of Dodge, and on the weekends I would run motorsports and the historical collections. I was doing all. <laughs> I did that for about five years. And so. how old were your kids at the time? They were uh, at the time 10, 12 years old. Can I just... Yeah, my wife had to quit working. <laughs> how did she... I mean, how did you not burn out in that period? That's a good question. Um, I did I did go through uh, spells of self-pity and, and just kind of, you know... Um, but what kept me sane was my own hobbies. I, I was always tinkering. Somehow I found a few hours a, a week to tinker. I'd go racing and just escape. And again, my family, I have a really strong family situation. So that was good. Um and a good team. At the end of the day, um, my design team is really, really strong. So I could, if the if the Dodge CEO thing got heavy, I could count on them to, to keep things going. Um, so, and then during all this, believe it or not, I got the entire global head of design. So they, uh, at, in 2013, Ramachodi retired for good. Um, and they gave me the global piece. So I was traveling to Europe once a month for seven years straight, uh, visiting the studios in Italy and then once in a while in South America. So yeah, it was, it was heavy. It was heavy to me. Did you... How, like I mean, you said your wife was really supportive. I mean, did she, did she put a lot of pressure on you as well to like carve out family time too? Uh, she just uh, came along. That, that's what ended up happening. Um, so every third time I'd go to Europe, she goes, "I'm coming with you," and then uh, she would bring the kids. And at, when I was at work, they would go explore. And she's like that. And and luckily, I had so many flying points from flying um, commercial. I would just never have to play for flights everything was covered that's amazing so, uh so i took the family everywhere south america she came with me china i've been to many times um london i've been to I've taken her because our board meetings would be in london so it's been exciting in that way you know so she, luckily she's willing to there's no issue traveling so she, she's 